Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Barry and Davis. I'm a uh, Chartered Quantity Surveyor with uh, BAM Building. And what I'd like to present today is on the 5D elements of BIM, bringing the theory into practice. And uh, how I intend to do that is, is um, I'm, I'm going to use, utilize uh, a table produced by the MBS called the Periodic Table of BIM. Now, for those of you that, that don't, don't know, the NBS is, is a company in the UK who are owned by the RIBA. And what they do is, uh, traditionally, they would have produced specifications, but they also produce uh, information for the construction industry on a wider context, and particularly um, in BIM at present, which includes things like the NBS BIM toolkit. Um, so what I'd like to do is, is to introduce elements of, of BIM by the use of this, this table. Um, and I think it's, it's useful within this graphic that uh, all aspects of BIM are represented on this table. They've, they've grouped them into subcategories. And maybe the, uh, the, the middle category that you see there is the technology category. And what's interesting about this is I think it clearly demonstrates that BIM is, is, is more than just technology. The technology um, takes up maybe five slides there, but standards, people, processes, and the like is actually what uh, BIM is about also. So what I'd like to do today is, is, is to pick out some of the elements um, from some of the categories and to explain the importance of these elements to quantity surveyors, um, try and understand a little as to how these elements affect our work, and to discuss some of the aspects that as quantity surveyors uh, we need to participate in. So to begin with, uh, element 48 of the chart, standardization and interoperability. I believe this is a bit of a, a cornerstone of, of BIM and, and it's essential for everybody to um, maximize the benefits of using BIM is to adopt standards. And um, within this, one of the benefits of BIM really is that we, um, as an industry, to reduce costs um, by means of um, streamlining our processes and becoming more efficient in what we do. And standardization assists us in, in, in doing that so that when we create information during the construction process, we don't lose that information when it's been passed from one party to another. It allows information to be used and enhanced time and time again, right the way through the life cycle of projects. And for quantity surveyors, and maybe anybody else who hasn't been involved in a BIM project uh, to date, there's the, the British Standard 1192, which sets out um, how documents produced on a project should be named. And the, the benefit that, that we would um, gain from that is that any project in Ireland or the UK that is working under this naming convention, anybody can walk onto that project, look at a document, and understand from, from the name alone what that document entails. So just, just quickly, if we look at the four examples up there, then uh, if we use the first one, the first group of, of letters is, is the project code, and that lets us know what project we're working on. The second group is the originator of that information. So in this case, it, it would be CETA. The next two groupings uh, would denote the, the zone or the level. And then finally, um, the next three groupings would, would uh, describe what type of document it is, who 
or what profession is the originator, and then the actual unique code for that document. So in, in the four examples that we see up there, we can see that, that we have three different projects, OFC, HOS, and SCH. There are three different companies working on those projects, which is CETA, BAM, and the SCSI. And then if we skip on to the, the final groupings, then the M3 tells us that that's a model. The SP tells us that document is a specification, and DR denotes that it's a drawing. And then the S's tell us that it's the structural engineer that's produced that information, and that A is the architect. I'm not sure if it's simple or if it's complex, but um, I've, I've found that, that working on several projects, I, I can see the benefit immediately in that when I'm sitting down on new projects, um, there's a vast amount of information to take on board. I can do a search, uh, maybe in, in, in the common data environment, do a search for SP, it pulls up all the specifications, and I can drive straight into the information that I need. So it's, it's, it's very useful. So the next element I'd like to discuss is, is the Master Information Delivery Plan, or the MIDP. This document is, is described in, in PAS 1192, and, and it's used to manage the delivery of information on, on projects, and it should list all the information deliverables that's to be produced on that project. Um, I have an example of, of, of one here. Now, I'm not expecting you to be able to see that uh, from there, but the reason why I'm, why I'm showing this image is, is almost to uh, dispel the myth that this is some uh, complex or magical document that's, that's out there. It's, it's just enhancing something that we probably have all used in our day-to-day -day, uh, lives on projects, and it's just simply a plan. It states the documents or the deliverables that we, we are required to produce. Um, it identifies who is to produce it, how long they will take to produce it, and uh, what other disciplines or professions are they reliant upon in order to produce that information. So as I say, it's, it's, it's nothing uh, too complex, but it just tries to set out uh, in, in a logical manner, and maybe to enhance uh, on uh, similar tools that we've used in the past in order to um, ensure that we um, issue out deliverables on a project um, in time. How this is relevant to the quantity surveyor is, is I'm, I'm, I'm just letting people know that this uh, plan exists. So if you're a quantity surveyor and you're starting on a project, ask for the MIDP, find out if it exists, and if it does, then make sure that your deliverables are placed within this document, and so that everyone knows what you have to produce. And then, as, as, as a, a design team or a project team, we can hit the targets that we need to. The next element I think is the most important, important of all, and that's engage. Um, it's great to see that everyone here uh, is, is engaging in, in, in BIM, but there are plenty of people within our industry in Ireland at the minute that aren't engaging. Um, as a quantity surveying profession, we're not going to reap the benefits from, from BIM if we're not engaging in the process. And, and, and Similarly, if, if we're not participating in BIM, then as an industry, 
Um, all the other professions are going to um, proceed at pace without us. And then all of a sudden, as quantity surveyors, we'll, we'll say, well, it's not quite right for us. And they'll probably turn around and say, well, tough. <coughs> Where were you when we were working on all this information? Um, I'm just showing an example here. Um, and, and it demonstrates a point. A lot of quantity surveyors that I've spoken to have, have said to me that they would like to engage in the process, but the models aren't ready. They can't take off quantities because models aren't ready. Or the other thing that, that people have said to me is that the only time that the model is sufficiently uh, developed for me to take off quantities is at handover. So then it's no good to me. Well, I don't believe that's true. And uh, the example that I, that I give here today is um, up on the, the, the top left. Visually, I'm sure everyone will say that model isn't finished or maybe not ready. But that's singularly the most useful model I've received as a quantity surveyor. This uh, was on a project that had just received planning. And I received that model. And in less than an hour, I was able to establish every space in, 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 in this project, which was a hotel. I could establish every floor area, ceiling area, wall area, and perimeter for every single space within that hotel in less than an hour. So if you engage, get models, find out what's in those models, and find out how to use them properly. Right, so the next element is, is software. Quantity surveyors may, may feel um, somewhat overawed or intimidated when, when um, entering into BIM for the first time. And one of the reasons could be because the amount of software and the software products which are out there. There are literally hundreds of software products um, which all do um, various different things. As a quantity surveyor, I think it's uh, all, all we need to understand is that there are four main categories of software products that we either um, need to be familiar with or, or need to know how they operate. The first is the authoring software, which is typically something like Revit or Tecla, which, which is the software that, that's used to create BIM models. The second is model viewers and checkers. This is a group of software that um, brings all the individual models together into one space so we can view the project as a whole and typically includes the check-in function. So if, if people have talked about clash detection, this is the software or, or the space that this would take place. There's the estimating and, and, and the quantity takeoff software that, that we would be looking to use as quantity surveyors and then finally, there's the common data environment hosting software. Um, in, in, in BIM and in non-BIM projects uh, at, at, at the minute, there's such big um, data available that it's very common now that, that, that all, all this data is placed into one um, space. But as a quantity surveyor, you need to understand that this software exists how to use it and how to maximize the benefit um, of, of finding information within this software. But that's, that's, in my opinion, are the only four bits of software that quantity surveyors need to understand to begin with. Moving on to library uh, objects. I think this is likely to be the most contentious element that I might discuss today because I find that lots of uh, different parties have different views about library objects and, and how they should be named. Um, library objects are effectively the component which create the model. 
Um, you could liken them to um, Lego blocks or bricks, if you like, which are intelligent and they contain the information that we need to understand as quantity surveyors. Um, the difficulty with, with the naming of library objects is that it can be uh, quite sporadic and, and very different as to how it's presented. There is a British standard. There are um, bodies such as the, um, the National uh, BIM Library. There are software vendors. Everybody creates objects and names them in a different manner. Even within the, the British standard 8541, this, this standard offers two alternatives as to how you may uh, name objects. One of those options is, is like uh, what you see on the screen here today, and I would say is probably typical of how you would see objects named. Um, I would comment that I think that that's okay as a naming, uh, how, how to name a library object, but I think it can be improved upon. Uh, BS8541 offers an alternative method to, to name library objects, and personally, I would like to see all objects named this way. The benefit of naming objects this way is it tells me as a quantity surveyor or as a, a user of this information much more about the object that's being modelled. In the first example, it's, it's telling me that it's, it's a 3D object, it's a wall, it's a brick wall, it's given me a thickness, and it's also given an LOD uh, for, which tells me how useful or what, what information can I rely upon from that object. Now, we had a discussion within BAM yesterday, and I'm, I'm told that even this doesn't comply with the British standard, but um, I think that's, that's part of the debate that needs to be had about getting to a common, or, or a common base as to how to name library objects. But how that affects us as, as quantity surveyors is in this way, is in, in these two examples, uh, these are from actual models that I've received. The example on the left is, is probably quite typical of, of most models that I receive and, and how things are named. Again, that's probably, probably adequate, but nothing more than adequate. Uh, the example on the right is very poor and tells me nothing at all. Um, just, just for maybe the non-quantity surveyors in the room, and, and the reason why, why I discuss this is how I take off quantities from the model directly relates to how the object is named. And, and so in the, the next two examples, you can see how my takeoff would look using the um, library objects shown on the previous slide. So the first one, as I say, is probably adequate. I can work out um, most of what's, what's been described there, but even with what's been described, I still have to go back. Um, I think there's one there, 150 mil architectural finishes. I still have to go either to another document or I have to go to uh, the architect himself in order for him to explain to me what that actually means. In the example on the bottom, then, you know, anybody's guess. We've got walls, it's arc one, arc, arc two, means absolutely nothing. But this is why it's important to us because in my takeoff, this is the information that's presented to me. So the better the, the naming of the library objects, the better quality of takeoff that I can perform. The next element um, I'd like to discuss is, is 33, which is the cost tools, the actual quantity takeoff. Um, there's a lot of discussion about quantity takeoff in, in that um, at, at present people would say that 
with BIM models, we're, we're working in, in, in two spaces. We're either working off the, the 2D information uh, in, a, in a manual way, or we're working in a 3D uh, automatic or automated takeoff using the object properties. Um, this is probably the big red button that people are saying that, 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 that it's great. We get a model, we press a button, out it comes. There are elements which are suitable for that, but not all. And this may be the, um, the aspect which is maybe frustrating to quantity su su surveyors. Sorry. And the, the third method is, is probably something which I use most often at the minute, which is a 3D manual takeoff. And I'd just like to show some examples. So this, this is a 2D manual takeoff. And probably most quantity surveyors in Ireland are using this method. The uh, scale rule is, is probably no longer used. This kind of software uh, is readily available. Some of it is even free. Um, and, and, and this is what we mean by a 2D manual takeoff. But there is some software that will operate in, in, in a 2D manner, but that you can um, portray that information in a 3D way. And what you can do with, with uh, that is you can validate the information that you've taken off yourself. You can show that information to maybe an architect or a main contractor or a subcontractor, and you can communicate the information effectively um, to ensure you, you get in the, the right result. The second aspect of that then is, is just an example of, of what I would call a 3D automated takeoff. There are certain elements with, within a BIM model which, which are particularly suitable to the big red button method. One of those is, is flows or flow finishes. Um, and that's typically because we're, we're looking at two measurements that we need from a floor. It's a square meter area and it's a linear meter. And, and more often than not, most models, um, whether they're good or bad, would contain that information. And we, we, we can get that information quite quickly. But the third uh, method which, which I discussed there is, is how, how we take off quantities when it's not quite so easy. One of the elements which, which is always going to be very difficult to take off as quantity of surveyors is, is curtain walling. And the reason being is that the way curtain walling is, is modeled is by its individual um, objects. So you would have glass and the frame, and these are all separate uh, objects. So it's very difficult for the uh, quantity surveyor to take this off automatically. So in, in this situation on, on, on a hotel, what I did was, was I did what I'd call the manual takeoff. This was quite a complicated facade in that there were several, several types of curtain walling systems. Um, as well as the glass within the curtain walling, there were um, metal panels of different colors. There was opaque glass of different colors. And they were all in different planes. And, um, I was trying to procure this package, and it was very difficult for me to um, understand from a 2D manner how this facade operated. So what I did was, was I did this 3D manual takeoff, and I was able to go into the architect's office. I was able to show him this elevation and say, or to ask him, have I interpret, interpreted your information correctly? And once we were able to establish that, I could go out with confidence to go and procure uh, my subcontractor. This next slide just, just sort of uh, is to just demonstrate that this is one of the components of that curtain wall. And it's important that in order to get the true surface area of the curtain wall in, that you would pick up on all the framing, which is possibly easier said than done. But the, the, the framing aspect of, of that elevation accounted for almost over 100 square meters of that elevation. So as a quantity surveyor, if we went out and we missed 100 square meters of curtain walling, we'd be in big trouble. So um, that's just an example of that. 
The next example of, of a, a, a 3D manual takeoff was, was in the basement of, of this hotel. And what I was trying to do in this situation was I was trying to measure the waterproofing membrane to the basement. It's rare that the waterproofing membrane is, is modelled, but it should be. So if there are any uh, engineers in the room, if you're, if you're sitting around the, the table with a quantity surveyor and he says, have you modelled the waterproofing membrane? And you might ask, well, what do you want that for? Well, it's for this reason. So I can do an automated takeoff of that element of the works. But nevertheless, it wasn't available in this model. So I went about um, measuring different objects uh, manually in order to get the surface area to measure my um, waterproof membrane. But what was really beneficial about that, and I've, I've zoomed in on this area, is that there was a thickening below the slab, which needed to be waterproofed. It had sloping sides. There was elements of triangulation uh, to be measured. And what I could do with the 3D model is take that off quickly, effectively, and accurately. And also, again, I could portray that information to other parties. So I could bring in the manufacturer, or I could bring in the subcontractor, show them that element, and they'd be fully au fait with, with the work that needed to be done. And then finally, um, as a group of elements, the um, resources at the end of the periodic table I think is, is, is fine for this presentation to group as one. And they relate to um, surveys and reports, events, um, blogs, and, and various resources which, which are available to everybody. Um, what I'd encourage is that quantity surveyors take part. Uh, there's an SCSI BIM working group that if, if people feel that they have time to contribute, they're more than welcome. They can also look at the information that's been provided through the SESI website. There are BIM hubs nationwide, which, which uh, meet on a regular basis and uh, hold events to discuss aspects of BIM. Everybody is, is more than welcome. Uh, there are CETA events that, that everybody in this room is, is aware of. But there's also lots of information available on platforms such as YouTube, Twitter, blogs, web pages such as the NBS BIM Toolkit. So hopefully, if, if there are quantity surveyors in, in the room here today, that, that if they intend to um, become involved in, in BIM projects, uh, hopefully these, these, these are some elements that, that they may, may look to understand first of all. That's the overall uh, periodic table of BIM, um, which as I say, I think is, is, is a great place to, to understand the entire BIM process. And finally, the most important message from me is engage. Thank you.